we're going to open the public hearing on House Bill 270 and call the prime sponsor, Representative Bolden. Good morning, Representative. Good morning. Good morning. Um, for the record, my name is Amanda Bolden. I'm representative for Hillford District 12, which is Manchester Ward 5. Um, I didn't ask anyone to come and speak today because I think we've been over this. And um, based on our conversation in the cafeteria a few weeks ago, my understanding is that the intention is to um, work on an amendment of some kind to tighten up the wording and make sure that we're actually going to accomplish our goal. Mm -hmm. Nothing outside of that. Um, so I don't really know what to do when your bill has two hearings. <laughs> OK. All right. Thank you. Are there any questions for the representative? Seeing none, I'm stating for the record that uh, I met with Representative Bolden as well as uh, Representative Fall, who was here this morning and is the chair of criminal justice. Um, it is the intent to um, work on this bill, and Representative Bolden is correct, to, uh, to address the issue, this particular issue, and use this bill as a vehicle for going forward for um, immunity for drug offenses when someone has overdosed. So, um, Representative Bolden is correct, and this is, again, this is the vehicle we're going to be using. So, thank you very much, <coughs> Representative. May I ask a question? Sure, you most me? certainly can. Um, do you have an amendment in mind, or is there a timeline for this kind of work? Well, we do have, we do have our Senate timelines. Um, this is not an FN, so we've got most of the month of April and a good portion of the month of May to work on this. So it's just a question of meeting with um, individuals and just coming up with some language. So I wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time because as you well know, you were there during the public hearing on the Senate version of this bill. There were a lot of unanswered questions. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where we're headed, but you will be included in the discussions and everything else as we're moving forward. I do have one um, comment, and I think I've said this already, but I hope that any amendments do not include um, requirements beyond a, a certain reasonable limit, requirements on the person receiving immunity to carry out certain actions, because in my opinion, the more complicated earning immunity becomes, the less effective this um, would be if made into law, because um, if uh, generally in this community where people are at risk of overdose and other people are in a position to save their lives, if the people that are in a position to save lives don't consistently earn immunity, then word, in my opinion, would quickly spread that the law isn't what it's cracked up to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I do want to discourage the committee from accepting any kind of wording that would um, require certain actions of oh. a person. For, Thank you. for example, you know, like engaging in CPR or something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that is one of the concerns that uh, I know that I have with the, with the Senate version, is that we have to be very clear um, with this particular population just exactly what immunity means. And so that's why we need so to So that's actually effective. So yes. we actually save lives. Yes. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Representative. Um, the Chair will call Representative John Fall. Thank you, Senator. For the record, my name is John E. Paul, Jr. I represent Cost District 5. I'm also the chairman of the Criminal Justice Committee. Uh, I appear here in support of this bill. Um, my only uh, caveat here is that uh, it's not a panacea. It, it will save lives. <coughs> we need to work on making sure that people who overdose don't repeat it. If there's any way we can do that, I'm concerned because sometimes it's a Thing, so. mm -hmm. Thank you uh, very much, Representative. Uh, are there any questions from the committee? Uh, Representative, those are the same concerns that the committee had, and that's why we are going to be working on this bill. And I, I want to make sure that you are included in the discussions. I appreciate that. So thank you very much, Representative. The chair will call um, Chief Crate. Good morning, Senator. 
Chair and members of the committee. My name is Richard Craig, Jr., and I'm here on behalf of the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police Association, and also the Chief of Police up in Enfield. And we're here in opposition to House Bill 270. There are simply too many unknowns relative to how this legislation may be exploited. We all want to save lives. But what my concern is, is that all we're doing by enacting this legislation would be kicking the can down the road. Addiction is a, is a terrible thing. The people that I've met with, the addicts that we've met with, that we've talked with, that we've gone to the calls where they've died, they're not breaking that cycle. And if this legislation passes, there's not gonna be a mechanism for us to save their lives. They're gonna just continue using. I was talking to the Chief of Tilton this morning, and their department has responded to an individual who they've used Narcan three separate occasions to bring them back to life. He believes that either Laconia or Franklin have responded to some one individual five times. Again, I didn't get in this job 27 years ago not to help people. So we do want to do that. And I think this is, doesn't make sense on some level, but we need to get people into treatment. And sometimes the only way we can do that is through the criminal justice system. We have drug courts throughout the state now. They're not 100% successful, but they do work. And, and I think by having that ability, we're able to, to help, and this doesn't do that. There's some way that we can not go through the criminal justice system and force people into treatment, then I'd be all for that. We're not gonna rest our way out of it, but we do need to get people into treatment. Otherwise, they're not gonna break that cycle. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. I know this is a very difficult piece of legislation and difficult situation to talk about, but I appreciate all your work that you've done so far. Thank you very much, Chief. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Lansky and Senator Bianchi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Chief, and thank you for being here. Um, do you see any way that we can fix this bill so that it might work, so that, you know, we don't have a dead person before they can get into treatment or whatever? I think, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the legal ramifications for putting somebody in the treatment, if there's a way to, um, either through the criminal justice system or, or something where they, maybe the Attorney General's office could work on this and, and come up with some way, some mechanism. Um, you know, that, that would be more for the, I think the lawyers, if you will, to see what would be legal and would you know, go through the court. If it was a civil process, um, along those lines, so they're not facing criminal sanctions, um, but at the same time, we can put somebody into that treatment. Well, yes, well, well, you did say that there were uh, too many unknowns in this bill. Is there a known that you would like to see in the bill that? I think the, the known is that help? we have, if I arrest somebody and we put in there that they have to go to treatment, or part of their sentencing is in treatment, then they saw, you know, that's something that, that they are able to do. It's, it's just that, it's like the stick in the carrot, if you will. And kind of how the drug courts work is that you can go through the drug court, if you're successful, that conviction is written off. Yes, you're under a lot of scrutiny, you're going to treatment, you're being watched by you know, our jail uh, superintendents and the jail people are supervising those individuals, so they're keeping them on track. That's one way. Another way, we had a young lady that her parents, fortunately, were able to send her to treatment. You know, that was the mechanism that we use, you know, in my, in my department in one case. So there are things that you can do, but it's without having to go through it. Yes, well, thank you. Just one last question. Do you see, um, this is about, you know, obviously granting immunity to someone who might call to save the life of this Okay. Do you see any way that we can make that uh, less fraught with concerns that you might have so that we do because it's 
according to testimony, it has been proven that if people feel they're not going to get into trouble, they're more likely to call for help. Well, we have, when I testified uh, at the House uh, with the representatives the first time, I heard studies that show that yes, people will call. If, if you ask me, uh, am I more likely to call 911? You know, if the question is, am I going to call 911 if I don't have to face consequences if I'm involved in something that like this? Of course, that, that's a no brain. Who would, who would say no to that? So when you do surveys, those questions, I think, are going to be, you know, they're fraught with, you know, you're not dealing with real life. We know we're seeing um, our chief of state EMS is here. He can tell you, I believe, how many EMS calls we're receiving to, to overdoses. I haven't heard yet where somebody didn't call in New Hampshire because they felt that they were going to be in fear of repercussions. And, and as a citizen, I have kind of a hard time that we're at a point now where we're not going to call 911 to save somebody's life because we're afraid to get in trouble. That's what our society has gone to. Uh, but I haven't seen those situations happen where you know we're doing that. And I think um, I don't. I think there's. Again, I, I understand the reasoning for this. We all want to do what we can to save people, but I'm not sure we're quite there yet where that's happening. I think the people that we're seeing, the good people, they get involved in you know some bad situations, either to be medical or they're just bad choices, and this is what's happening to a lot of people. But I see that you know again, all we're doing is pushing it down the road a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Daniels. Thank you. Uh, what percentage of the time would you say that uh, drug clubs were working? I don't have the statistics, and I think it depends on each jurisdiction. Uh, I can get that for you, at least with Grafton County. I can, I can get that, and we'll provide that to you at the time. But I think we can see you know, how successful those are. What I do know is um, there's, you know, there's a lot of different variables, depending on you know, what they're dealing with in the situation, if I can get you that, that information. Okay. And Madam Chair, yes. if we can make get some statistics from the counties or particularly Rockingham and those mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Thank you. Are there any further questions for Chief Gray? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. The Chair will call Nick McCurry. in support of this bill. Uh, we believe that uh, there are many concerns out there that individuals will not call for help if there's any fear for prosecution. So that is our, our main concern and our main support for this bill. So we want to make sure that 911 is called and people receive the support in emergency medical care at the time of the event. So we are in support of this bill. One of the things that we do respectfully request is in line seven, I believe. Um, it discusses prima facie contraband or evidence. And we are a little bit concerned with that wording because of how the medications, whether illicit or otherwise, sometimes present themselves um, and request that you consider uh, may be reasonably believed by law enforcement to be present at the scene as opposed to prima facie evidence. Um, because things come in many ways, shapes, and forms these days, so sometimes it's very difficult to tell whether it's actually an illicit medication, um, a prescription that's not actually the person's, which is part of the overdose, it may be a very legitimate medication, but it not, may not be that individual. So we request you consider just widening that a little bit. Senator Daniels, thank you for your testimony. When you said line seven, were you you're actually talking about section seven? I'm sorry, thank, thank you for the correction. Yes, section seven. Thank you. <coughs> okay, 
Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Thank you. Are there any other member of the public that would like to speak to House Bill 270? Yeah. Okay, please hold on. Sarah Sadowski. Hello and thank you for your time. For the record, my name is Sarah Sadowski. I typically wear an orange badge. I'd like to apologize. I seem to have lost it on the way in. So um, for the record, I work for New Futures. We do policy and advocacy work. And I just didn't want to miss the opportunity to express our support for this bill and ask for your support as well. Today, I've brought some testimony from a family support group here in town, Family Sharing Without Shame. A parent has written a letter about what this would mean to their family personally. We think this bill could save lives, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony. Hey, okay, um, the chair will call Devin Chaffee. Good morning, Ms. Chaffee. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair and other members of the committee. My name is Devin Chafee, and for the record, uh, um, I am the Executive Director of the ACLU of New Hampshire. Uh, I want to express uh, our organization's uh, sincere thanks to this committee for uh, the seriousness for which you are considering this bill um, and for the commitment to, to find a solution um, uh, to address what is really an urgent problem um, in the state of New Hampshire with regards to preventing overdoses. Um, I think it's so important that this committee is considering taking a, a step that uh, 22 other states uh, in the country have taken uh, one step towards saving lives um, because if a person dies of a, of a potential overdose, uh, uh, as we know, they cannot go into treatment. Um, you know, and this, so what this bill is really about is providing second chances to those individuals. I'm not going to repeat uh, the testimony that I gave uh, on Senate Bill 147 as to why this, this uh, bill is so important. I think at that hearing you heard not only from me, but also a number of family members of victims of overdoses <coughs> whose lives could have been saved uh, if individuals had been willing to call 911. So I'm gonna leave that to the record as it stood on SB uh, 147. But there were um, a couple of, of things that I did wanna bring up. Um, the issue of immunity, um, in, in the criminal context is a complicated one, which I think this committee has, has realized in figuring out how, uh, what the specific language of this bill should, should look like. Um, I think most of the precedent with regards to immunity uh, comes up in the context of witness immunity um, uh, in, in the context of a criminal trial. But I did want to bring up that, and under New Hampshire law, uh, there, are, uh, there is another example of the type of immunity that is being suggested here um, with regards to immunity um, for individuals that seek emergency assistance in case of an overdose. And so I just wanted to refer the committee um, to section 169-C uh, colon 31, which is uh, immunity for both criminal and civil liability for individuals who uh, report violations of the Child Protection Act. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that we're, it's not unknown under New Hampshire criminal law, this type of, of broad immunity for, or, or limited immunity um, against criminal prosecution. The other um, issues that I just wanted to highlight quickly um, are related to the amendment that uh, Senator Lasky had worked uh, quite extensively with the Attorney General a 2 SB 147 that was introduced at the previous hearing. And there were just two issues um, related to uh, that proposal that I just wanted to highlight for you today because I wasn't able uh, to comment them on them um, in my previous testimony. And that is one thing that that um, amendment, as the, the amendment that was proposed to SB 147 did not include was that it did not include immunity for parole uh, or probation violations or uh, violations of pretrial release agreements. And I do think that that is incredibly important to be included in both bills. So as you're considering this language, that would be one um, particular issue that I hope that the committee would give uh, attention to. The other concern that was brought up at the previous hearing um, on SB 147 
was whether uh, Section 5 of that amendment um, undermined the immunity that was provided uh, previously in, uh, in the amendment uh, against immunity against um, arrest or prosecution. Uh, there was a concern that it essentially turned the immunity that was provided into more of an evidentiary immunity instead of an immunity against arrest. We do feel that it's very important to dispose effectiveness that it be immunity for against arrest, arrest, that people are not going to call 911 unless they know that they're not going to be arrested for it. It's not enough that it simply be some kind of affirmative defense once they're already in the criminal justice system. So I do have a suggested uh, a fix for this problem, which would be to amend that section to say, the immunity provisions of this section do, do, do not preclude prosecution of the person on the basis of evidence not gained as a proximate result of the person's seeking medical assistance for a drug overdose, but are obtained from an independent source. And so in my opinion, that what that does is it deletes the reference to use or derivative use um, and, and so that it's no longer a question, of, it's clearly no longer a question of, of evidentiary immunity. It sort of removes that potential confusion um, and preserves the immunity that's given uh, earlier in the proposed amendment, uh, which is immunity uh, against arrest. So thank you so much for your time, Madam Chair, and I'll be Thank you very much for your testimony this morning. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Pierce. Can you give me the, the citation to RSA 169? C31. I'm sorry? 169C31? Yes. Okay, thank you. You can have one coffee, so. That's okay. I've got this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the chair will call Representative Edwards. Good morning, Representative. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair and members of the committee. So I wasn't going to speak again on this bill. You heard my testimony on Senator Kelly's bill a few weeks ago. But in light of some misinformation that was presented by an earlier uh, speaker, I just wanted to remind you of the evidence that I brought forth at the previous hearing about um, how this bill, the effects that this type of legislation has had in other states. So that it's one thing to have unfounded, to have fears about how something, um, that something might not help a problem. But when you have actual evidence over a time span of eight years, such as in New Mexico and in Washington State, then that actual evidence and actual data should, um, should address potential concerns. One concern that I heard was that this doesn't, this might not help with overdose deaths, but the data contradicts that. In New Mexico, um, opioid overdose deaths rose every single year since 1990. Then they passed uh, the, this, they uh, passed this two-pronged solution, the availability, availability of Narcan and the 911 immunity. Uh, it was, New Mexico was the first state to do both of them together, and in 2011 and 2012, for the first time since 1990, they saw overdose deaths drop two years in a row, which is completely contrary to the national trends of increasing overdose deaths. So if you think that this bill might not help the problem, it will help the problem. We have data. Um, I gave you my citations from studies in Washington State and in New Mexico on what actually happens as a result of legislation of this type. Uh, New Hampshire is not considering this solution uh, in isolation. We have, uh, we have evidence from other states to consider, and the evidence is strongly in favor of this bill and contradicts any testimony um, that it would get in the way of police work, for example. The variable you want to affect is overdose deaths. This legislation and the Narcan bill work together to do exactly that. 26 other states have passed one or both versions. Okay, thank you very much, Representative. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing on House Bill 270.